Hey pals, I'm here today after a bit of an unplanned break. I will always say this, I genuinely don't know how some people are so amazing at consistently uploading two or three times a week. I'm never going to be that person. Work's been really busy lately and so as soon as I finish work I just want to like turn off and not have to think about anything where I need to be analytical or articulate which are two things I strive to do on this channel, don't know if that actually works. And, and also seeing as some of the social distancing rules have decreased in England, we've been trying to see people who we haven't before been able to see for quite a long period of time. And so I've just been being more social than I like to be, usually, to be honest. So I was hoping to read a book a day in June, lol, that didn't happen. I think I read like 10 or 11 books life, I don't know, it just got in the way. So I'm forever determined to just fill all my time with reading and then I'm reminded that I also love playing board games and I also love watching films and I also love watching binge TV and I also love watching ridiculous amounts of booktube and I'm also supposed to socialise with people and work a full-time job and inevitably I don't manage to read any more than I read in the previous months. So. <laughs> All that being said, I'm just going to talk about these books in the order that I read them because I usually talk about books from my least to my most favourite, but I can't be bothered <laughs> to sort them. So I just started talking about the books and then a siren started going off, I think it was an ambulance, and I was you know, sitting here, it sort of rolled my eyes and then was reminded how awful it is to be annoyed at hearing an emergency response siren. So. I'm an awful person. <laughs> this is what Booktube brings me to. So the first book I read was Assembly by Natasha Brown. It is a newly released novella. I read it on Kindle but I guess it's like 100 to 120 pages. It's pretty short and it's written from the perspective of a young black British woman who works in some sort of financial sector in London and she's super super wealthy and she is dating a white upper middle class man who doesn't have to have a job because he comes from lots of old money and we're watching her in a couple of days as it builds up to her going to meet his parents at like a big social party they're throwing at their manor house. So what I really enjoyed about this book is thematically it's exactly what I'm interested in. There's an awful lot of commentary on race, class and gender and the intersection between all those things on old money versus new and also a lot of commentary on what this specific woman could expect and desire out of a relationship and sort of the limitations she was putting on that because of all these other factors at play in her life. There's a sort of undercurrent of you as the reader knowing that she's had some sort of bad news to do with her health that she isn't sharing with her partner and so you feel like a bit of a voyeur into the situation which I thought was handled pretty well. So I enjoyed this book for all its themes but it's super short so there's not much of an actual narrative and I am somebody who, who does enjoy an element of narrative to the books I read so I don't think I can enjoy this you know much more than the freestyle level but I would 100% read any full length novel or essay collection this author released, especially essay collection. I feel like she has a lot to say that would work really well in a collection of essays. The next one I read was a graphic novel called Ghosts by Raina Telgemeier. This is a graphic novel aimed at the middle grade age range. I've heard lots about this author and I saw one of her books at the library. I have nothing more to say other than this was just okay. Gave it like two stars, wouldn't really recommend it. I felt like it was lacking in heart or depth and I'm not going to be reading any more books by this author. The next book was my favourite read of June, so I highly recommend it, and that was King of Rabbits by Carla Neblet. This is a debut novel which I was kindly sent from the publisher because this one came out a couple of months ago, and I haven't heard many people talk about this one, which is a shame because I think a lot of people would really enjoy this novel. So we follow a young mixed race boy called Kai who lives on a council estate in rural Somerset, which is a location I don't think we hear an awful lot about in contemporary fiction. And this is told in um, two timelines. So one timeline when Kai is a very young boy in the 90s, and then a more contemporary timeline when Kai is around 16 years old. In the 90s timeline this is a bit reminiscent of something like My Name is Liam by Kit DeWall and I guess the sort of vibe you get from Jacqueline Wilson books if you read those when you were younger 
but times both of those like pairings by 10 because this is a lot grittier and darker than those books so if like you read my name is Leon and found that a bit much in terms of um, the sadness and the way children were tweet treated like this is worse um, Kai grows up in a house where both his mother and father are addicts and because of this their parenting is nearly at zero he sees and is involved in a lot of things that he should never see or be involved in and you read all those sections with a building sense of dread because inevitably you know children don't usually survive that type of lifestyle unscathed. I thought those sections were beautifully written and those sections are told in third person so it's very close third person but you're not hearing it from Kai's perspective which I think really works because I know some people, I'm not one of them, but I know some people don't like reading directly from a child's perspective because they find that a bit irritating um, and you're not in this case, you're, you're hearing it from a like, close third so you see it through the eyes of Kai, there's, there's moments he doesn't understand which as an adult reader you will but it's not written in a sort of simplified writing style to match the way a child would talk which I think worked really well and then in the more contemporary narrative we hear directly from Kai's perspective so it's first person I, I found those sections much harder to read um, Kai's in a very bleak place which is is difficult to read alongside the the childhood narrative because obviously you're hoping that things get better for him and you know in that later narrative that they don't and what both of these narratives are, are building around is is two things really one is that in the 90s narrative um, Kai absolutely idolises his father but we find out very early on that his father is involved in lots of criminal activity which you know we think is going to build towards something and then in the more contemporary narrative Kai's father is no longer around and so we're sort of having that revealed to us how that came to pass and the other thing is in the 90s narrative Kai has a, a girl at school who is his best friend who completely loves and adores and he is talking about her in the contemporary narrative and how much he misses her and how much he regrets and so we're also aware that there's something that happened with her that is going to be revealed which you know is something you find out um, much later on in the book I thought this was absolutely brilliant I'd give this like four and a half stars I would read everything this author brings out in future I'd highly recommend it like I say if you think that you could read something that's like my name is Leon but way more difficult um, I did find the more contemporary sections quite quite depressing because they are um, but they were still really beautifully written I think she has a really good sense of place I could picture every single room in their house I could picture all the outdoor spaces that Kai spent time in um, all these people felt really um, true and honest and they didn't feel like they'd been made into caricatures in order to um, you know increase the drama they felt like real true people who were making genuine mistakes and even at moments when you intensely disliked somebody um, for letting Kai down so greatly I think this book always told their story in a way where you always empathised because you always understood that you were from a different place to them um, and in their shoes you know you don't know if you'd do any better really so I think this was was written with, um, with a lot of respect and a lot of um, care and affection for every character involved but it's it's pretty depressing so um yeah so I would 100% recommend this and the only reason I didn't give this five stars is because when I read a book that is um has more than one narrative thread I want to feel like I'm always ha equally happy to be in both narratives and I didn't feel that way I felt like I preferred being in the 90s narrative and so that just slightly lessened the book like the tiniest bit for me because you know I don't want to feel that way really um, but this is a, a high recommendation and um, one of my favourite books I've read so far this year and like I say my favourite book that I read in the month of June and then the next book is also a new release and this is one of my most anticipated new releases because I really love this author's work and that is Ghosted by Jen Ashworth I was also kindly sent this one from the publisher for review now I have previously read 
let me double check. The author's debut novel, which is a kind of intimacy, um, their third and fourth novel, which are the Friday Gospels and Fell. Um, so I've not read their second novel and they also brought out a memoir last year, which I haven't read either. So, like I said, this is Ghosted and it has a brilliant cover, <laughs> firstly. This is about a woman whose husband goes missing. One day he just doesn't come home, she has no idea where he's gone, but he's left all of his things at home. So his wallet, his passport, everything has been left behind in their flat. And she does nothing with that information. She doesn't report it, she doesn't tell his family, friends, she doesn't tell the police. And after some weeks go by, she realises that perhaps she should report it. And she does. And from that point on, everybody distrusts her, because how bizarre is that to like not immediately tell everybody when your husband just disappears off the face of the earth. And so we follow her narrative and we're sort of inside her head as she tries to articulate why she made and is making the decisions that she is making. And it's a pretty weird space to be in. So I would say that a lot of the people in this narrative are pretty unlikable. Um, a big element of this narrative is that Laurie has a father who she has a pretty difficult relationship with who has Alzheimer's and when she visits him like difficult things come up and his remembrance of events we are unsure whether he's misremembering them because of his Alzheimer's or whether Laurie tells us he's misremembering them because she can because because of his condition we're unsure and so she sort of through him allowing herself to rewrite history character who is really likeable is his carer um, I really liked her as a character um, she was very strong-willed and forthright and I thought she was a good counterpart to Laurie. Now what I'll say about this is the most recent Jen Ashworth novel I read was her first novel which is a kind of intimacy and the concept of that novel is that a woman moves to a new neighbourhood and she becomes obsessed with the man who lives next door with his partner, like properly hardcore obsessed. And she's super weird and she does really odd stalkery things. And we know that she has some sort of history, some secrets that we want to uncover. And this, Jen Ashworth's newest novel, felt very similar in theme and also in tone. Um, so when I read A Kind of Intimacy and when I read Ghosted, I got this sort of feeling of like, like, you're like a voyeur to something that's a bit dirty and like sordid, right? And a little bit twisted. And you don't really know if you want to be a voyeur to that thing, which I think is like very well done. That's obviously what Jen Ashworth is setting out to do. Um, I don't know how much I enjoy it as a reader. And I also think that having read A Kind of Intimacy and, and giving it like a three star and then reading this one and feeling like it's sort of playing with very similar themes and, and plot points, it didn't feel different enough from one of her other novels, I think. So I think if you've come to Jen Ashworth and you haven't read A Kind of Intimacy yet, then you might enjoy this one more than I did. I think I'd enjoy this one more if I hadn't read A Kind of Intimacy. Um, I think which is always interesting about an author's work because if you read, read them like completely as standalones, then that's one thing. But if you read them knowing about their own body of work, then you, you will notice repetitive themes, um, which can lessen um, the individual merit of each book or like the individual success for you as a reader of each book. So yeah, I enjoyed this one. I think she can write brilliantly, but I've said this time and time again, I'm not great at unlikable protagonists and she is pretty unlikable um, as are most of the characters involved. Um, this is very bleak, this is very slow. Um, when we started to get the reveals I found it interesting um, but I don't know I, I feel like maybe 50 pages could be cut from this and it would maybe be a slightly stronger book so um, yeah I gave this one three stars and I would recommend it to readers who like unsettling narratives with unlikable protagonists. So after saying that I felt it had been a bit unfair to Ghosted by Jan Ashworth having, you know, read another one of her books which played with similar themes, I then bizarrely picked up a another book which had similar themes to Ghosted 
because this next book is also about a wife whose husband has gone missing and that is Empire of Wild by Sherry Demoline. This is also a recent release that I was really excited about and so pre-ordered it and this is written, like I said, by Sherry Demoline. She is a member of the Georgian Bay uh, Métis community in Ontario. Um, this is set, I believe, near Georgian Bay as well. And this opens when our protagonist husband has been missing for over a year. She's absolutely devastated until still trying to find him. And after going on like an all-night bender with her cousin, she is at a Walmart the next day to get like hangover supplies and she sees a revival tent in the car park. And she thinks it's like a circus or something, so she's sort of drunkenly drawn to it. And when she goes in, she realises that it is actually a Baptist revival tent and that the preacher is her missing husband. This man is immediately surrounded by other members of this um, Baptist congregation, all of whom deny that he is the man she, he, she says he is, and he also says that he is not her husband. So she then um, goes back to her family and friends and tells people, most of whom don't believe her, but a couple of people do. One of them is her young nephew, who we're never really told his age, but I assume he's around 14, perhaps a bit younger. And another is her grandmother's sister who also believes her. Now, her grandmother's sister believes that her husband um, could have been taken by the Roguru. I think that's how you say it, but I apologise if not. And she thinks he's sort of been harnessed by um, this evil presence and that's caused him to lose a sense of who he is. And so she thinks that he needs to be saved. And we then watch our protagonist with the help of her nephew as they sort of go on this adventure to try to bring him back. And what I wasn't expecting, but that does come, become part of the narrative, is that we start to hear from like the bad guy's perspective. So the man who is um, sort of paying for this Baptist revival group to travel around Canada, we hear from his perspective and like he's pretty clearly the villain and we also hear, sh hear some short snippets from her um, missing husband's perspective where he is um, in some type of unearthly place being held. I think that's probably the best way to put it. Now, when I initially read the first couple of chapters of this, I really loved it. It just opens um, before she, she sees this man who she thinks is her husband um, and she, it's like a normal day, she goes around to have dinner um, with her mother and her grandmother and her brothers. Um, the sort of family dynamic really worked for me, just the descriptions of the homes um, and the environment and the people, I could really picture it all and it had this really immediately believable feeling to it. Like I could, I could within a few pages of being introduced to these people, I could see their community, I could see the homes they lived in, um, I, I understood their concerns and their desires. And so I had pretty high hopes for this one, and unfortunately they weren't met. So my issue with this was everyone other than the protagonist and her family. I felt that all the like the baddies, which is this man who runs the Baptist revival group, and then all the other people in that community were like paper thin, incredibly tropey. Um, there's one woman who's part of um, the Baptist group who ran away from some sort of cult she got involved in. Um, I thought that was incredibly stereotypical. Um, like I said, the bad guy was really stereotypical. And there was also just a couple of points, and particularly when describing the baddies, that I felt were like, like just badly written. So, like this for example, a man in a black suit and a grey fedora in this improbable heat, his red bow tie the colour of shock and murder. I thought that was awful. If her heart was a song, someone smashed the bass drum and pulled all of the strings off the guitar. Notes fell like hail, plinking into the soft basket of her guts. That was pretty bad too. And then another one, there's just some descriptions that like just didn't make sense to me. The seated figure gave a deep laugh. The sound filled the clearing like vomit, like a menacing growl. 
how can a sound fill a space like vomit? I don't know, do you know? <laughs> so yeah, sadly, I just, yeah, it didn't work for me. Like I said, there was elements of this that worked, but then as soon as this became a lot more like tropey, I felt like all of that was handled with an incredibly heavy hand. Um, and also I just think an editor should have been doing a lot more crossing out and question marks on some of the um, descriptions in this narrative. So didn't work for me. I think there's going to be loads of people who enjoy um, more fast paced plot driven narratives who this will work for, but I'm not one of them. The next one is a live book that I've also returned and that is Sisters by Daisy Johnson. <laughs> I requested this at my library, like I think last October. And then it took this long to get to me because of all the various lockdowns in England, which is absolutely fine because I actually think this worked quite well as a sort of spring summer read. I read this in one afternoon sitting out in my garden when it was really warm and I think that worked really well for it. So this is a pretty short novel and this is about two sisters who have moved to a sort of old broken down house with their mother who is clearly suffering from some sort of period of really severe depression and we're told that that is brought on by something the girls did and the narrative sort of dances around what the girls did the book is filled with menace and building dread which is pretty much there from the start and gets almost unbearable at points at least for me so these sisters are fucked up and the older sister gets the younger sister to do some pretty twisted things. It's very clear there is a relationship here of um, significant abuse and control and I always think this is really interesting when this is done between siblings because my thought always is if you've been raised like that by somebody who supposedly loves you then how would you know any different because like you don't know a life without them. I also thought it was really interesting how when we saw moments from the past we saw how the mother had tried to um, like get closer to both of the girls as individuals but was really sort of blocked out of having any form of bond with either of them because of this unbreakable bond they had between them. And we're pretty vague with the plot here and that's because the book is pretty vague throughout. So I had an assumption, I had two assumptions really um that were pretty different i'm not gonna say what either of them are one of them was correct and i had a look at the reviews for this and this has actually got a fairly low rating on goodreads i think it's sitting at like 3.50 and a lot of those poor reviews were because people said that the the twist like where this book went was incredibly obvious and actually when i finished this book i came in to tell johnny and he was like oh that's so overdone like we've seen so many films that use that narrative like like why do people continue to do it and i sort of saw johnny and all the others reviewers points however i think the author writes beautifully um, i've read all of her previous books and yeah she writes truly beautifully um, some people said like her writing's a bit pretentious i don't know her writing is incredibly descriptive um very aware of um, the natural world and also um the physicality of having a body so it's very sensual um, and sometimes it's sensual to the point of I, like, I guess like disgust it borders that edge between something being um, beautiful and something being horrifying which I enjoy I'd read anything this author wrote yes the narrative is probably a bit overdone and yes you could probably see where it was going to go um, but I think those final few pages gave what the author desired to me which is I read them with <laughs> this sort of horror slash elation and then this massive thud down to earth as I realised what had actually happened and this is one of those books where I gave it four stars when I finished it because I was like brilliant and probably now like reconsidering it, it it will probably be a bit forgettable because the story in and of itself isn't anything spectacular so maybe a three stars is more appropriate but I think this is beautifully written and yeah so I don't know <laughs> if you enjoy if you've read Daisy Johnson like I preferred this to her previous novel um, I thought it was stronger than that but 
I probably still think her short stories were stronger than, than Ivan novel and that's because what I think is truly spectacular about her is her writing and the themes she focuses on and I think writing and themes excel much more in short stories than they do in novels. Do you agree? <laughs> the next one I want to talk about is another new release that was kindly sent by the publishers and that is Of Woman and Salt by Gabriela Garcia. So I initially was super excited to read this book because it is badged as a novel about a family of Cuban women and I was like I love stories about women basically and haven't read any I don't think about women from Cuba. But then when this arrived in post I was a bit put off by this family tree on the back which may sound odd because I know a family tree excites lots of readers. The reason the family tree made me feel a bit nervy about this book is because I've realised I don't really enjoy like epic stories so I don't enjoy stories that we spend some time with one character and then just as you're building up to this epic moment in their lives we jump forward 20 years and suddenly that character becomes like not super important because we're now focusing on their child. That's not really something I enjoy. However, that isn't what this book does. This book is an interesting one because I feel like this has been badged as a novel. Um, and I think a lot of people might come to this and feel like it's lacking that thread that draws a novel together, like it's lacking um, that, that plot arc. And I sort of agree. I, I feel like this could have been badged as a collection of interlinked short stories, but then, uh, you know, some people who like to read short stories would have come to this and been like, oh, this feels too much like a novel. So it's, it's probably one of those books that could never win <laughs> in the way it was going to be sold, but it really worked for me nonetheless. So we're following a, a group of women, mainly who are all related to one another and the earliest we go back is I think the 1860s in Cuba and then we come all the way up to the present day in Miami which is where some of the descendants of the family from Cuba now live. And we're also following um, a woman and her daughter who are neighbours of the contemporary, I guess, I don't even know how many great granddaughters but one of the um, woman who is probably in her 30s who lives in Miami um, and her neighbours are Salvadorian by nationality and right at the start of the narrative um, the mother is taken to a detention centre because um, she doesn't have the appropriate um, visa to, to be in the US. And so the rest of the narrative is us um, jumping around these, these Cuban women and also um, sporadically hearing the story from um, the Salvadorian mother and Salvadorian daughter's perspective. I think independently, as short stories, these were great. Um, a couple of these really stood out. I particularly enjoyed um, Carmen. So Carmen is uh, the mother of Jeanette and she's probably, I don't know, in like her 60s. And I just thought she was a super compelling character. Um, there's a moment where she's trying to host the dinner party um, and her daughter Jeanette is a recovering addict and so there's lots of tension around that and her wanting this dinner party to be perfect and she's she's clearly quite controlling and it, it's sort of trying to keep um, all of her family in these little boxes. She doesn't want anyone to know anyone else's secrets and she doesn't want anything that could be construed as sort of gossip and at the same time as that is happening and um, she sees some blood near her neighbour's house and she hears a growling from the house um, and throughout this dinner party she keeps sort of thinking about that and thinking whether she should do something about it uh, and, and we sort of follow um, this dinner party and, and her decision as to whether to sort of investigate the blood and the growls from the neighbour's house and, and I just thought it was excellent. Um, I enjoyed every section that was from, um, from Jean's perspective, I thought her story was really intriguing and um, her story was told out of order so we meet her in this sort of contemporary time period where she is um, recovering from being an addict and she's um, broken up from this man who she had this sort of toxic addictive relationship with um, and then we go back into the past and she how she became an addict I just thought it was really well written, I really liked all these women, I'd read anything this author brought out in the future, I'd be super happy if she brought out a novel, I'd be super happy if she brought out a short story collection because she could clearly do both very well, so there's that one. Now the next one is book four in an epic fantasy series and that is 
Shadows Return by Lynn Flewelling. So this is book four in the Night Runner series. And I read the first three books quite a few years ago. I absolutely loved the first two. I was completely in love with them. So much so that Johnny went online and like ordered me the fourth and the fifth book as a surprise so I could just carry on binging through them. And then I got to the third book and I thought it was rubbish, like such a letdown, literally couldn't believe how disappointing it was. And that has put me off going back to them for years. Um, but Chris over at the channel, Chris's Bookish Cauldron, has been doing a buddy read um, where we're reading one book written by Lynn Fuelling each month for the rest of 2021. And June was the month to read Shadow's Return. So I planned to reread all the others but kept putting it off because I knew how awful book three was and in the end I just jumped back into the fourth book. Now, these are a series, but they're a series where there's like um, plot arcs within inside the books. So like books one and two are one plot arc and book three is sort of a standalone. I think this and the next book are another plot arc and then maybe six and seven are a different one. So I can't really tell you much, can I? Um, we follow two men called Alex and Seragal who are in a queer relationship with one another and they have faced many sort of awful things together in the previous books and there's some characters we know and love um, and they are trained spies and thieves and they've previously worked for um, the royal family as a group of um, sort of secret spies called the Night Runners and in this book they are tasked with going to collect one of the princesses back um, because she is like in another location and they need to go get her. And on the way, something kicks off, which sort of results in Alex and Seragal being in a pretty dire situation for the majority of the book. So, um, I was okay with it. I mean, there is um, some pretty horrible scenes in this book, like um, torture and stuff like that. I mean, fantasy is a weird thing. So I feel like fantasy can get away with more, um, more violent scenes than, than like, a contemporary like realistic book could because it's it's sort of not in our world so it doesn't feel quite as awful um, and I, I will say like I've read worse stuff than this in like some of the Robin Hobb realm of the other things books but this wasn't particularly nice um, and I, I read a lot of reviews where people said they struggled with it I really I mean like I don't love this book um I think the like the plot itself wasn't anything super special and um, but I liked the characters, it was certainly stronger than the last one and I gave this four stars, I just got a lot of joy out of it um, I read it really quickly in like two days and it reminded me again, I said this all the time, of how much I love reading fantasy how much joy it brings me and how I need to fit it in to my like monthly reading on a much more regular basis because I used to read so much more um, and you know, I've had so many duds with fantasy um, but there are still some gems out there that I will enjoy, so I'm going to carry on reading the fifth one this month. Then another new release, this is one I borrowed from the library, and that is The Hard Crowd by Rachel Kushner. This is a collection of collected essays, and I wanted to give this a go, mainly because it's got a really cool cover, has it not? Um, and I, I, I keep thinking that I will like essay collections, and so I want to read more of them and I thought this one might work for me. Sadly, I wasn't really a massive fan of this one. I was lured in by the first essay, which I thought was excellent, it was a personal essay. And there was a couple of other personal essays throughout the collection, which I enjoyed. Um, but the majority of these essays are actually, like, criticism on, like, books, film, art, all those sorts of things. Rachel Kushner knows a lot of famous people, which is mentioned quite a lot. She's incredibly intelligent. Um, very intellectual and because she was talking about books I hadn't read, films I hadn't watched and art I haven't heard of, all of which I had no interest in, um, this just was a massive disappointment. I was just clearly the wrong reader um, but I kept reading in the hope that there would be more personal essays because I'd so enjoyed that first personal essay. So I think if you enjoy criticism um, if you're interested in the types of thing Rachel Kushner is interested in, this will work for you. What I'd recommend is like trying to find a copy of this in a bookshop or a library and um, flicking through the content page and seeing if she's talking about books, films and art that you are intrigued by. And um, if she isn't, then this probably won't work for you either. But 
what do I know? The next one is another one I've taken back to the library and that is The Night Watch by Louise Erdrich. So I did a recent library book haul and quite a few people commented saying that this one had just won the Pulitzer, which I had no idea, it's not a prize I follow. And so I thought I'd best read this because I'm pretty sure more people are gonna be requesting it because it's just won the Pulitzer. And actually I took it back the other day and saw another couple of copies. The library's obviously stocked up on them. So I have previously read The Roundhouse by this author many years ago and really enjoyed it and always meant to go back and read more of her books so I'm very glad I got to this one. So this is um, set in the early 1950s and it is um, set near the Turtle Mountain Reservation in rural North Dakota and it follows a man who is um, the night watchman at a factory and he is also a Chippewa Council member. This narrative is based on Louise Erdrich's own grandfather, okay? So there was a bill that was trying to go through Congress in 1953, which was gonna basically um, terminate all the rights of native people. And some groups, um, Louise Erdrich's grandfather being the council member of one of them, um, were not having any of it um, and, and, and fought against it. So, Part of the narrative is, is us following um, this man called Thomas as he tries to bring all the people together and um, to fight against this bill and as he um, works in the factory and he also appears to be seeing ghosts um, and this ghost is a boy who he was um, at a residential school with. So you know there's a, a really sad history behind that which is sort of slowly revealed throughout the narrative. Another part of the narrative is that we're following a, a young woman called Patrice who most people call Pixie and she works at the factory where Thomas is a watchman and her sister um, recently moved away to one of the cities and has disappeared um, and no one has heard from her and so Patrice is trying to save up money to go to that city to try and search for her sister which would be like a really big undertaking. And this is the 1950s. Um, Patrice has never left her small town. She has no idea what to expect in the city. Um, and so it's a really interesting perspective to watch. So, first half of this book, I read really quickly and I loved, and I was thinking, God, this could be a five star read. Um, really unexpected because it was just one I reserved because I wanted to give another Louise Erdrick book a go. Um, and I was, I was loving it. And then sadly, um, the second half didn't really work for me, so much so that this probably ended up being like a three, three and a half star read. So, I think the reasons this didn't completely work for me are because of who I am as a reader, not necessarily because of the book. So I'm going to try and explain that so you can figure out if it's something that you would um, enjoy and something that would work for you. Whilst we have these two plots, you know, what's happened to this missing sister, um, and what's going to happen with this bill. They sort of go to the back seat a bit once you get probably a third to halfway through the novel and actually the novel becomes about the community so you start to get much shorter chapters just following different members of the community and I didn't mind that because I actually felt the novel built up a really good sense of who all these people were and all their connections and feelings towards one another, which I liked. What I started to find a bit frustrating is that a lot of this becomes about who's attracted to who. Um, Patrice is clearly a very attractive woman, um, and initially two men are interested in her, um, and that becomes quite a big point. And, and at another point in the narrative, Patrice becomes... Um, really engrossed in the idea of losing her virginity after having a conversation with one of her friends about like exactly what sex is and I don't know I just found that a bit odd like her sister is missing she is she understands that her sister wherever she is is probably being held against her will in pretty dire situation um but instead we just follow her for ages thinking about how she's going to lose her virginity um, the men that fancy her and which one she should approach about it. And the second half of the book, again, another narrative that, that really comes into play is that there's these two Mormon men who um, started going around this community door to door to try and convert people. Um, one of these Mormon men becomes interested in one of the young women in the community and we start to get chapters from 
the Mormon men's perspective, like about how they feel like they're sinning and like what they should do. Um, I didn't understand why they were given a story. Uh, and one of the men who's interested in Patrice is a, a white man who like, yeah, doesn't have like great thoughts about her, um, her like ethnicity or her history. And um, I, I didn't really know why he was given a perspective and why I was supposed to care who he ended up with. Um, so yeah, like the book opens with these two really strong plot lines and they do come back into play, but a significant portion of this book felt like it was like, who's gonna fuck who? And I wasn't really interested in that. So um, yeah, I think this book will, will really work for lots of people. Um, for me, for those reasons, I didn't end up loving it. And then lastly, my book club pick for um, some of the people who very kindly support me on Patreon was The Scapegoat by Daphne du Maurier. I have read quite a few Daphne du Maurier books now, um, and I've read four or five of her sort of really well-known novels quite a few years ago and loved them, and then have tried quite a few more novels over the years and had a rather poor success rate, so I was incredibly happy to read and really enjoy this one. Um, I did a spoilery reading vlog over on my Patreon. Um, if you are interested, it's always linked down below. And yeah, this was um, a really good one because she writes beautifully and also her books always have, you know, a decent amount of plot. So I really enjoyed sort of guessing and trying to figure out where this was gonna go. If you don't know, this is about um, two men who meet one another um, on a train somewhere in France and realise they are doppelgangers, they um, look and sound just like one another. And the Englishman John is a French professor, so he speaks French very well um, and he knows a lot about like French customs and history. Um, they go on like an all night bender together and when the Englishman wakes up the next morning the French man has stolen his identity. So he thinks, well, what should I do? Like, should I go to the police? Or should I steal his life back? And that's what he does. And then you follow um, like what happens after that as he tries to um, take on the life of this French man and like trick all of this French man's relatives into thinking that he is the real Jean. Because they've got the same name as well. <laughs> so um, I really enjoyed this. Um, and it really reminded me not only how much I enjoy Daphne du Maurier, but how much I enjoy books like this. So um, I definitely want to start collecting more of these um, sort of reissued greens vines from Virago. Um, but also this just reminded me that I need to read more books, um, you know, that were published in the 1950s because I used to read a lot more. I get so much joy out of them. And um, this one reminded me of that. So that's all the books. And if you're interested, for this month's book club on Patreon, we're reading Transcendent Kingdom by Yadassi because I know lots of people read that one and I thought it would be an interesting one to read and to talk about. So yeah, let me know if you've read any of these books, what your thoughts were on them. Um, I would be interested to know. And yeah, I hope you're having a good day. Thanks for watching, I'll see you in the next video. Bye.